Hello and welcome to episode three of Full Swing Thoughts, a fried egg podcast on the Netflix golf docuseries named Full Swing. You are joined by, uh, I'm Brendan Porath, uh, host of the Shotgun Start podcast, contributor at the Fried Egg, Andy Johnson of the Fried Egg and the Shotgun Start podcast, and Joseph LaMagna, uh, a friend of the Fried Egg podcast, Fried Egg uh, website as well. Um, and a host of Full Swing Thoughts. Guys, we are going to jump into episode three right now. We've done one and two, which was, what was it? Frenemies, a, a title that Joseph found great, uh, took great issue with uh, as not illustrative of, of the actual real world and, and the substance of that relationship. This episode two was win or go home on, you know, Brooks and Scotty Scheffler. And sort of the mental anguish or mental, the very varied stages where they're at in their careers. And then episode three now takes us to money or legacy. And I don't know. I haven't jumped way ahead here. I'm not done. I don't know if this is the live episode or the primary live episode. If there's more live, uh, a more an episode that takes it on more directly, I'm not sure. But money or legacy is a pretty direct call out to the live storyline of 2022. Um, it features largely Ian Poulter. It features a lot of like the live discussion, the first live event, live London, some players and WGC match play. Those are the primary settings. Ian Poulter is the primary ca character and the tension of live versus the PGA tour is the primary storyline. Is that enough of a synopsis, Joseph? Is that hit what we need to hit? Yeah, I think so. Okay. It, it introduces Liv. Maybe it doesn't give like tons of background about Liv, but it introduces the product to the viewer. It okay. skirts it skirts around Liv. It's it's pretty you know. I think it it does a good job with the discussion of what an individual player is thinking of, but I don't think it fully represents why Liv is so attractive outside of the money thing to players and why live was a viable option. It does not touch on any of the reasoning why live even was able to gain a foothold amongst the PGA tours, best players. Is it, who would do that? How would you do that? Who would you talk to Norman? Who would you talk to for that? Somebody, some more, uh, some commentator. Who Honestly, I think a great guest would have been Andy Gardner of the PGL, um, who could have provided the, you know, the flaws of, of the PGA tours, uh, business model, which weren't illuminated at all. And I thought was a, a pretty huge shortcoming in the episode, not to get really into it right off the bat, let's, but let's, let's get into it. Let's get into it. I mean, Joseph, what did you think of the episode overall? What was your main takeaway? What what were your kind of conclusions after watching this one? Um, I, I don't know that I took a ton away from this episode as yeah. somebody who's been following the live storyline very closely over the past year. A couple thoughts that came to mind that maybe touch on, especially what Andy is saying there. For one, I, I think it got into like the CNN headlines around the, some of the problems with Liv and in the Saudi Arabian connection and really dramatized that. I'm not sure that it explained the nature of, of the structure well enough so that people could have maybe a little bit more of a nuanced view of what Liv represents. Um, that was one of my takeaways. And the other one, which I, maybe I'm teeing Andy up here, but I do think with Netflix renewing a season of featuring the PGA Tour, it is in Netflix's best interest for the PGA Tour to be successful and to portray live a certain way. So that was kind of in the back of my mind as somebody who doesn't want to see live succeed. It wasn't the most glorifying uh, portrayal of live as a product. Would you say it was unfair? I don't know that it was unfair. It, it was just maybe a little bit shallow. Okay. It it seemed like they weren't going to really get into, like, I as I said just a few seconds ago, like, there's a very real reason why Liv became an option. And that was the PGA Tours. I, I think everybody look at what's going on now on the PGA Tour, all the changes. Like, I don't think it's unfair to say the PGA Tours neglect towards advancing their product. And I feel 
as if, you know, the conversation didn't really touch on why, like, if if we were looking at any other sports league, it would be tremendously difficult for a a um an outside organization to just break in and take some of the best players in the world, right? Like, you know, and I think that they failed to hit on what made this even viable. And obviously, as Joseph just pointed out, you know, Netflix does have an inherent interest in in the PGA Tour succeeding. And I I also want the PGA Tour to succeed, but this feels like this was a very half-hearted attempt at telling the story of Liv. It's the biggest story in golf in 40 years, non-Tiger arrival, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a massive story. Maybe there's an entire season that I, I don't know, but was it just too big to tell? accurately was it too big like so they just leaned on a couple news clips which i along with joseph made a note of it was a little weird that we just like are going washington to washington massive yeah massive story via a few news clips like cnn this morning round table like the deal that one was it was just odd and i would say like look we do the grades at the end of these things we were i don't know if we planned on it but we did on the first two this episode sucked. It was a wholehearted F for me. I thought, and I find Ian Poulter to be moderately interesting. It's not just because he's unlikable, like I, I, that I didn't like it. Like, I think he's interesting. I'm ready to subscribe to an Ian Poulter, but I thought it went a bunch of different directions without ever getting anywhere, if that yeah. makes sense. Like, there's this random Ryder Cup interlude, right? Where we're talking about Ryder Cup history, and I get that part of Poulter's lore. Poulter, like in this episode, is completely uninteresting. There's nothing new told about him. He wears the loud trousers. He's sitting at the couch with his family talking about having to jog to the eighth. Like, I thought it doesn't go anywhere. I thought it was a horrible episode. I thought it didn't advance really any kind of storyline, didn't tell us anything new. I didn't find Ian Poulter to be interesting at all. I found his decision to be like moderately interesting towards the end, like moderately, although I wouldn't say that's portrayed all that accurately, right? It's it's talking about, and, and I think it's not real genuine. And I'll go, I there was a, Shane Ryan had a write-up of the show in Golf Digest. And this is like, I don't know, inside part of his reporting. Um, it says, at least one signing happened almost by accident. At the 2021 US Open, Chad Mum, who's the executive producer, had a long meeting with Bryson DeChambeau's agent, Brett Falkoff to secure his participation and never panned out. But at a nearby table, Ian Poulter looked at his phone and pretended indifference long after he had finished eating. When the meeting ended, mom decided he had nothing to lose and introduced himself. Poulter was happy to talk and told the Netflix team if they were making Drive to Survive for golf, he was their man. And it feels like Ian Poulter like forced himself into this show to like... I get like the other guys have self motivations, right? Like, I mean, like it's in it for the JT brand to be in the show and Ricky and everybody else. But like nothing about this seems genuine. It's like he wants to put a void. He forced himself into the show. We don't really learn a ton new about him. And he, and he wants to put his voice to this. He's not like a particularly consequential golfer either. And Joel Damon, I guess you put in the same boat. That's the next episode. But we learned interesting things about Joel Damon. I don't think we learned anything new about Ian, Ian Poulter. And I just thought it was like a disaster of an episode that went a bunch of different different directions without getting us anything new or anywhere in the end. I uh, I agree. I I think the episode was bad, but I will push back on. I do feel. Uh, I would say that one of the things I was disappointed in, I wonder, I just don't necessarily know if they got a lot. I think like some of the blame needs to go on the interviews and what they selected of Poulter to show because like it seemed, I thought, you know, in a way, some of what Poulter gave out as the reasoning of, of why he's going to live is what, I think is can be rationalized in terms of like to him for him, the guy him going to live versus Brooks. Right. And I think Brooks's episode actually set up well for like understanding his decision to go to live. Right. But Poulter's, I think they did a good job of subtly telling why 
Ian Poulter would go to live. He's old. And one of the things I took away was how often in the episode, Poulter referred to golf as a means of providing for his family. And that's why he played golf. Like he talked about, you know, and I think these are obviously live talking points, but I did feel some, some sense of um, realness to the time away from four kids. I think that could weigh on somebody. It seemed like he was not, He's. It didn't seem to me that he was like a uninterested parent, and obviously that's easy no. to portray in a short no. po- period of time. But like, I do believe. Like, I thought it was interesting. You know, when he was leaving Austin, it wasn't about losing; it was about not making money and a zero week and in a negative balance. And obviously, like Ian Poulter's sparing PGA. no expense. Yeah, the PGA, uh, the PGA, the one the PGA. Like, it's utterly yeah. infuriating. Yeah, those cuts. They really hammer that home. The cut. Yeah. Issue. Yeah. So I think from like a sense of like I did get gather like Ian Poulter's view of professional golf is not about major championships. It's more about making money to provide for his family. And he is somebody that grew up very humble means as they kind of talked about with the municipal golf and like his, you know, they didn't have an extravagant and he is over the top with the way he lives his life, which, so you know, say, if, is it for his family or his Ferrari habit? Yeah. Well, it's Ferrari habit. It's the, like it, those aren't cheap private jets that he's flying. He's flying his entire family across uh, the Atlantic in private in a big private jet. He's, you know, like he is not the his. I think that was like a super interesting. It's this guy that doesn't have money going in to professional golf that gets money that lives lavishly, like his closet. Everything they showed about his life was opulence. But right? we knew that. Like this yes. isn't. It, it's just. Like, I, it was just I'm like just, time spinning the clock. I didn't think like we got anywhere. Or knew any get anything new? Like we know he has I a th- bunch of trousers and he packs his. Go ahead. I just think that it showed like it's almost like money to Ian Poulter's an addiction and live fueled his late career when the money was running out. And he he's looking at this like that's the way he looks at his job. He looks at golf as a way to make money and certain players like we saw with like Brooks, like money's important to Brooks. But I think like the 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 championships and being the alpha was like more important to Brooks. Right. Poulter is like just money um, outside of like the Ryder Cup. They, they tried to crowbar in this Ryder Cup thing, um, yeah. which I mean, it didn't really work. But like, you know, to me, the Ryder Cup was the only deterrent to him going to live from the way they portrayed it. Um, and I, so I think that I felt like I came away a little bit understanding. And, and I think they Poulter was the most about uh, among the players that went that aging star if you can call Poulter a star the aging guy who got offered an absurd amount of money at age 46 was the most understandable what would have been a way more interesting live conversation would have been Brooks or would have been Cam Smith or would have been DJ even where you have like elite players giving up everything from a competition standpoint. So that's why it's a big miss. This isn't that interesting of a story because it is like the one that's like, yeah, it makes sense why he went to live. I don't think I'd go as far as to say that it was terrible. It just made me feel nothing. And I think the the part that you can't escape when you watch the episode is that Ian Poulter goes from not achieving his goal at match play, so he misses out on the Masters. Just a non-story. Like, that wasn't even close. He's, like, got boat raced by Fitz, lost his first one, and, well, like... I think that's part of the story. We're just wasting time. It's an, I know. It's, a, I it's, know. An old man, it's an old man trying to compete in a young man's game, and he's being... I think it actually sets the story of that, Ian Poulter. That's I the thought point it was I'm making. Like he, Go he goes from whiffing at the match play to missing the cut at the PGA Championship to teeing it up at Live London. And you like that is sort of the mainstream why most guys went to Live, they they can't compete. But it's not everybody. And I agree with Andy that 
if you want to have an episode called uh what is it money or legacy yeah ian poulter's legacy isn't that deep so i don't think he's the perfect person to be interviewing to talk about some of the profound considerations around going to live because his his rationale isn't that deep it's pretty easy to understand he's 46 years old and he's not a relevant story on the tour and i guess like i i get your guys um or andy's at least contention that they were a little thin on explaining why live was such a potential disruptor but like they're also not they're giving Poulter mostly the floor here and if he's putting his entire voice to the decision like to the point like I get that we they paint the picture of him being old and there's that interesting uh interlude in the in the Austin locker room where Paul Casey of all people jumps in is like my back I'm old and, and Poulter you know you're even older they, they joke about it that's kind of a, a big call out so I get that they're sort of non-verbally telling the story, but like he's not, Bolter's not pressed. He's given the floor to like articulate his reasoning, his decision, his family and all this other bullshit. And it ends with like, I love being a professional golfer. I love competing. I just want to continue playing great golf all over the world. And he says, you know, I'm not done. I've played golf at the highest level. I continue. I'm a winner. I want to be a winner. And then he goes, I bring a personality. I have a great social media fo- plat- uh, following. This is a platform for me to continue to be the personality that I've been on tour for the last 20 years, which is a non-golf issue. And that's why he's in this show. And so he just like, he articulates his reasons for going without ever being pushed, except for when they show the Live London press conference, right? That's the only, mo- then he shuts up real fast. Then all the the inter, all the like Netflix interviews of him where he's just sort of going on and on and and I'm not saying those those are disingenuous moments, but he should also be pushed in the in that interview with Netflix a little bit about like isn't this just for money? Do you have concerns about where the money is coming from? The only time he shuts up and feels chastened or has to explain himself outside of like the basics is from a media interview at the Live London when they're like you know would you play for Putin or is there any moral objection that where you wouldn't play? So I just felt like if you came into this cold and you knew nothing about Ian Poulter, nothing, maybe you'd find it interesting. Like, look at this guy. He wears loud clothes and he used to have weird hair. But and he's this, you know, Ryder Cup hero. It just felt like we got really no insight and nothing new about Ian Poulter. That's that was my only and and I'm not that's not because I'm averse to Ian Poulter. I think he's could be really compelling. It just felt like he went totally unchallenged and um and didn't really we didn't get anything, any insight. What well, we did get some insight. You what? know, we got the the scene of uh of Poulter and Pat Perez talking pip at uh, the was, players. That's that was in my the, notes. That yeah. was the best part of the whole thing is is Pat Perez who, you know, Memorized. I don't know if anybody over the last 12 months has gone from like a a public favorite to a, you know, like just a goof more than Pat Perez, but Wait, him can- talking him can we, talking can we about, talk about the uh can we talk about the instagram thing for a second did yes. anyone else did anyone else look this up so pat perez says to ian poulter you have five hundred ninety-one thousand followers on instagram did you audit him did you audit this did, did anyone okay. else look up how many he has now do you think it's higher or lower than it was a year ago lower Poulter. it is it is lower now i don't know if instagram did any bot cleaning but i don't think going to live has necessarily increased Ian Poulter's following in the way that he thought it would. <laughs> Interesting. How about them complaining about Ricky? Not posting. He never posts. Yeah. Because he's in 15 commercials or whatever. I thought it was wild how Pat Perez had everybody's followings on various platforms committed to memory. Well, I think it it, it showcases a little bit, you know, to the guys that went to live and, and how bothered they were by the pip, right? How like the, the and how interested they were in the money being just doled out, right? Like that. That I thought that was a you know it it gave you a little bit of a lens into like Ian Poulter talking about how much he post like he, how many followers he has, how how Ricky never posts. You know, it shows that he was really trying. Yeah, I I just thought this over dramatized the decision he had. Like he's playing coy. 
Like yeah. we knew he was going. Yeah. Right. You know, like everybody knew he was going. He plays coy, and I mean, I guess the Ryder Cup threw a little bit of uncertainty. He goes, "There's a lot of uncertainties." Well, there's not, and like the Ryder Cup thing's pretty cut and dry, right? At that point, like to understand, you are likely forfeiting a chance to be on the Ryder Cup or captain a Ryder Cup at that point. We're talking June. Um, I, you talked about how he lived a big life, lives, lives a big lifestyle, right? And, and spends a lot of money and, and views his career as a money mate. It's, it's purely to make money. A really revelatory quote was, well, you know, people tell me, don't you have enough al- already? In response, well, that's all relative. Right. So like relative to what? Relative to how much he spends, relative to the way he lives his life, relative to how much else is out there. It's an interesting quote about like, it's not really relative. I guess it is. I, I don't know. I mean, some people, you know, buy hundred dollar ball markers and it's just it's like a drop in the bucket and that's relative. I think that's kind of insane. But, you know, any quote, I want to maximize every bit of my potential over the coming years. Well, what potential? Like his potential Earning as a golfer potential. is right. His potential as a golfer is expended, and that's pretty well drawn out. And, and I think his quotes about "I can still win," "I'm a winner." He says, "I'm a winner." Like he's like looking in the mirror. You know, I'm smart. I'm handsome. I'm a winner. Like he hasn't won on the European tour in I, like a decade. He won, I think, 2018. He won that Houston. Uh, event. Houston, I when, think, was his last Bo, win. Bo Hostler helped him out with that he's so like too. i get the Ryder cup legacy entirely but and he has a substantial career i'm not dismissing his career but like his potential is not as like a golfer but his potential is as that personality and as a earner on live yeah i mean sense? he got to top five in the world rankings i mean he, that's he's nothing sure to, to be... mention that he throws yeah. that out there i know i'm not dismissing his resume i'm talking about 2022 Ian Poulter. Go ahead, Joseph. I was just going to say, I think the part that I don't know that we're beating around a bush, but he's just not that interesting of a person. And they made an entire episode out of something that wasn't that interesting. I don't know that I think Netflix should have pressed him really hard on his decision or like should have portrayed Liv in some totally different way. It just wasn't that interesting of subject matter. And that's more where I land. It just didn't make me feel anything. I also noted that I think it's a bit rich that like Fitzpatrick, Matt Fitzpatrick and Scotty Scheffler are featured a little bit in this episode. And they're the perfect examples of people who aren't going to live because they're beating Ian Poulter. So like yeah. that is part of the story here. Like a 46 year old cash is a big check. And I watched 40 minutes of it. Just wasn't that interesting. <laughs> That's, That's I, I thought that, uh, it was it was perfect that Fitz and Scheffler, two of the major winners of the year, two of the guys that rose up and became stars the most in 2022, were the guys that were drumming this old guy that everybody used to fear, and when they when they'd get him in their match play, you know, group, and it was like that was, I thought the most powerful aspect of this episode was it's this old guy who can't really compete anymore trying to compete and somebody dangled a bunch of money in front of him and he took it right and that's why i think the the more interesting as we've talked about live story resides in in the big guys that that didn't that that haven't been profiled about their decision and as brendan alluded to in the shane ryan piece you know bryson not saying yes clearly you know when that would have been like that would have been the perfect live that's the perfect money or legacy storyline the perfect money or legacy storyline is brooks or or dj and that's or cam smith and that's not what we got we got like i mean we got old ass polter just taking a big guaranteed pay. It, this is like when when the guy that everybody knows is over the hill gets one last fat contract because that some team was desperate for the star power at age 34 in the nba you know i would have even been all right with that if we learned something new about ian Poulter, but we didn't it was just the same kind of the hits the hits of the hits about the trousers and the the social media following it just what do you want to learn about him and his family i don't know i like I mean, the Netflix got what they wanted out of this episode because they got him chucking shit in the locker room and that's on every trailer fake, and they fake or real I, I don't know. 
I think real. I had anger, that. I had it written throw. down as my fake or real. Well, I don't know that it happens it, with the cameras aren't there, but right. I believe that Ian Poulter has chucked shit around the locker room before in anger many times. So, like, it's kind of a hard one to call. I think Joseph, it was fake. I, th- th- I said real <laughs> anger, fake throw. Like, okay, okay, yeah, yeah. But it's in everything. It's like that's that's the moment that they plucked and is on all the promotional stuff. Um, How about the music for the live intro? I found that I, that really was great. Amazing. Big old bag of cash. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, it very, it in a very not subtle, conspicuous way sets the scene. It doesn't portray it in a great light, right? I mean, it's a pretty derogatory portrayal or, or use usage, right? I mean, that's why they're doing it. Yeah, I almost think like, too much it's it's a little overdone to me yeah. to be honest and i don't necessarily agree with the people who say like ian poulter don't you have enough money like that's not where i come from like if you want to make as much money as you want have at it i'm not gonna watch but have at it it's so i think it was a little like the big bags of money intro on the live event like we get the point I, I didn't feel. I think it might be a little overdone. On like, you think a, a little bit more sub, uh, subdued song that references money would have been better. Or or you don't even have to mention it at all. I think the point is pretty clear that Ian Poulter went to live because he got forty million dollars, which is more money than he's ever made in his career. I think that is pretty clear. Playing big bag of money, like, does that add anything for you? I didn't. I I mean I thought it, it was. A memorable moment it was amusing it's very like just in your face and i think it's telling the story without telling without saying it out loud or you know you know what i mean uh, just narrating it precisely they did bring in brandle to talk about it they did bring in the press conferences right those having um graham mcdowell pushed and phil pushed and and poulter and westy pushed i didn't feel like i got a lot from the live london scenes that I think one of the big misses, like, with less interesting people so far on the show, the best, you know, kind of the best people to carry those storylines are outsiders. We saw it with Mike Thomas with JT, you know, and one of the things this episode missed was like, could you interview somebody that's like close with Poulter that was Poulter? Like, I think the person that did the best job of like explaining Poulter was Matt Fitzpatrick who talked about like, you know, if I had a chance to beat, like if you would have told me 10 years ago, like that, and it, that's not even his peer. Like where was the interview? And I I think that's like another aspect of this episode falling short is like, where was the interview that some, with somebody that could provide context around, uh, Poulter. And that didn't exist. That was, you know, like his kid wasn't going to provide that Luke, you know, uh, you know, the, Luke. well, Brandel wasn't going to provide that. Brandel's very clear, like what, what he's going to say about the subject matter. Like there was no, like, I would have loved to have heard from somebody like, and I, I'm not, I know that these, this isn't easy to do, but like, why not more from Ricky who like, you know, they showed him talking about the decision, right. And how he hadn't made one yet, which I thought was a very interesting anecdote but it went nowhere and this is another failure of the episode is ricky is your one of your commentators and his perspective would have been really interesting because it it was like very given given the year i mean there was a, a multiple week period where ricky seemed like he was going so maybe he would have been somebody that could have added color without having to go get or and maybe he did and maybe it just didn't make it into the episode but like that's the thing that I just really felt disappointed about was that like this Poulter might not be the most interesting storyline and he might not he he might have been. But the the failure was on the production of the episode pulling the storyline, the interest out, because there is way more here than what was shown. And that's the disappointing thing. Where was like Adam Scott would have been in a superb commentator on this, like an international player, similar age group and uh, somebody that like was not, you know, completely in the PGA tour bucket. That's the thing that kind of 
you know, I'm not a live backer, but this this was a one sided story. And that's the failure of the episode is that there wasn't, you know, like Ian Poulter didn't need to be very interesting for this to be a great episode. I, I actually disagree. My my bigger takeaway is that these shows, whether it's the tennis one, the F1 show, are most interesting within the context of competition, right? Brooks, really interesting to think about his fall from the peak and what that means for his competitive career. Same with Scotty Scheffler. Like you learn a little bit about him and then he wins the Masters. An episode about somebody exiting the competitive landscape is just not that interesting to me. And I think it kind of shows why Liv isn't a competitive product. And so I, I hear you on like, it was only one-sided. I don't disagree with some of what you're saying, but I think a golf show is most compelling within the context of competition. And there's no competition here. Ian Poulter is is not a competitive golfer. That's sort of... that. that. That was a little bit of my frustration with it. Like, is we're just going a bunch of different directions uh, with something that's not particularly consequential at this moment. Right. Um, and so we have an interlude, like, on the Ryder Cup. We have an interlude on Greg Norman. We have, like, who he is and what he's doing, but it's for a minute. We have an interlude on these news clips. We have Ricky jumping in. And I agree with Andy, though. Why not get Why not get his, you know, mens rea? Or, like, get his uh, mental... W- Maybe he wouldn't have testified. Maybe he would not have spoken honestly about it, even for the Netflix. But like that would have been compelling to understand. That's my whole thing was like, we knew Poulter was going. Even in June, we knew this was happening and it was just over dramatized and played coy without, you know, telling us anything new about his thought process. We we knew in March. There we go. How about, I mean, the other thing is like, if you're going to characterize this live thing, where was like the Riviera footage? Where was, you know, the uh, talking about where it just blew up? The Phil interlude was like That was nothing. weird, too. Another one is quick, quick. Right. Like, you're talking, you just, that's how you're going to characterize Phil. We talked about it with the with the first episode with the PGA. You're going to characterize Phil, and I get that he's like persona non, non grata, but he's the second most influential golfer uh, of this generation. And you just breeze over the fact that he completely ostracized himself from the game over this subject matter. Yeah. Yeah. It just, it felt a little directionless for me and and that's all. Um, Should we hit notes? Random empty the notes. I'll start with Fitz. I was amused at the little quick uh, quip that Poulter almost broke his hand. (laughs) That was funny, funny moment. I'd say my most amusing moment of the episode is that Poulter kicking his son saying this is my chair when we fly like he has a specific chair on the private jets um it seems very Ian Poulter and like telling his kid to scram uh other notes that you guys had from episode three Ricky never posts we talked about love I mean this was nothing new but it was powerful as the golf nut the Monaghan press conference footage from the players just like in hindsight of course we knew what it was said we knew it was coming But just to see it so clearly displayed about our players, our partners, most importantly, our fans. We've been about legacy, not leverage. And it just how about moving on? Well, that this is another thing I had. This this is the first note was like the the whole Monaghan thing that I had moving on. That's how you start the episode with moving on. And then like, you know, we don't basically contacts. We don't need to worry about this. And there's no tie back to, well, all these guys just left. Right, <laughs> right, 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 right. You, that's a good point. You should, you should jump cut from we're moving on to like a month later, Dustin Johnson's gone, Bryson's gone, Phil's gone. Like you didn't move on. Yeah, that's, that's like the thing. And this is where I guess my theory, like I, I hadn't. I had watched this just breeze through casually and, you know, I've kind of gone through where I've rewatched everything and in yesterday er, in the, in the recording on the second one, that PGA tour thing just became a little bit more real for me in here because of the way that Monahan Monahan they characterize as this leader who like, who's like this strong leader who's saying, we're moving on. We're not worried about this, but then like, don't, like how absurd that those quotes were two months later was insane. You know how like 
poor, poorly led the tour was through this, you know, is not even touched on. And, and I think that that's one of my, you know, big, big takeaways from this. You know, I, I actually didn't know. And this is on me. I didn't know he had four kids. I thought I knew about his kid, Luke, because of the golf stuff, but I had no clue he had four kids. My brother and in like, arms, my brother in arms, father yeah. of four. Um, yeah, I guess I knew Luke. Yeah, I don't think I knew he had such young kids. Four. So that was a revelation, honestly, to me. Um, okay. And I, the other thing that they didn't hit on, I think Poulter is like maybe his most interesting aspect of Ian Poulter is the backstory that he turned pro as a four handicap PGA pro. And, yeah, uh, like he wasn't a good golfer when he turned pro, and he there like there Ian Poulter is like the classic case of irrational confidence, you know, and like never has had like eye popping skills. Like he's kind of like and and that wasn't really portrayed. Like I think that's something that I've like been disappointed in general is like we got like watching the tennis one like i've gotten a really good understanding a more of an understanding of like what these tennis players are like as players and and this is an individual sport like you know this would be like talking about lebron and not talking about the size speed and athleticism they brought into the game like ian poulter's discourse should have been like he's like a normal guy who has pretty ordinary golf skills who managed to work his way into a top five player in the game. And like, that was just a discarded story. Like, this is not a story, you know? And I think that's a big miss in, in some of these portrayals. Like the interesting thing about Ian Poulter is how this guy became a top five player in the world. Yeah. But and then, and then crafted a personality that then yeah. he forced into this show. Right. I mean, that's a part of his story. He's not a normal guy anymore. Normal golfer, right, is what you're saying. Like an average skill, like no eye popping yeah. skills. Uh, Joseph, do you have any other notes that you want to get out there? Like the random odds and ends from the episode? I don't have a ton of notes. I have a few to share, but um, I guess that's somewhat where I landed. I haven't seen the entire show. So I agree with you. If this is the live episode, then big failure. If they're going to add more context later down the line, not as big of a failure. So I don't, I haven't watched past. So I, I assume can't, I can't Cameron really Smith. Look, is that a live part? Andy, you're ahead of us. I there's there's a little bit of a little bit. It's not anything substantial in the. I mean, in the okay. open with and it's in the Rory episode, and it talks about kind of what Rory is shouldered a little bit. But the, I mean, there's almost more time spent on. Rory telling us about how the tour championship, you know, is is almost bigger than a major. All which right, we'll get to is, that. We'll get to that in episode eight. All right. So then I ahead. so then I agree with you, right? If if this wasn't if this was not a super deep look at Liv and it wasn't a super deep look at Poulter, then what was it? Right. And we, we probably could have done without any of the scenes from Dell Match Play, any of the scenes from the PGA Championship, and just gone deeper on those subjects. So I I, I agree with you on that. Only other notes. I had on basically the only other note I have was about his family. I thought it was interesting to get a look into his family and it seems like a normal, like I thought yeah. they came across well. And what yep. I like yep. is that his kids play golf. Like that act that his passion for the game is persisting through his family. He's not some bitter person who is upset with the game of golf is cashing his check. And then his kids are never going to think about golf again. Like he wants golf to be a part of his life and it is a part of his family's life, which resonated with me to an extent i you know i did uh i had down here uh the luke's quote about like he's gonna do the right thing What's for our family us? right and you know for i i you know i think that's obviously as a parent like what you know your your goal is always to be like to do what's right for your family right and if that and obviously this is a kid who's not like doesn't understand all of life's and definitely probably doesn't understand this whole situation. But like at the end of the day, you know, there is like some, you know, I, I found that just interesting as you think about life. I um, would, I just think he bounces around a little bit too much talking about wanting to compete globally, wanting to like, he's just, he's kind of, I don't think it, there are I, a lot I of live the, talking points that I, he right, conveyed. Right. Right. Um, one other note I had, which just made me 
kind of wonder about the series as a whole. The question from the production staff, do you love playing in the Ryder Cup? Like, they're just teeing these up for like clips, right? I mean, that's not like, that's not a question that's going anywhere. That's not a question that's going to yield anything interesting or new other than it did when he said there's a bear shit in the woods and is the Pope Catholic. But it's like, what kind of questions are being asked to prompt some of these answers that are clipped into the show? Because that's like just not a real question. Do you know what I'm saying? I'm not saying that's bad. Maybe that's just how you do these things for a documentary. But it was interesting to hear that. As like, what? what? What is that? What do you mean? Do you love playing in the Ryder Cup? How about DJ Perez and Poltz yucking it up at the PGA? About, I think that was going to the F1 race in Miami, I think it was, was what they were talking about. Um, that was an Pat, interesting Pat question. Perez is just like, I, I, I've become, come to find him like the most unlikable guy in golf. Pat Perez, over the age of 40, for those who are not aware, right? Like, there's a through line here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm fascinated. You know, we'll wrap this up. But honestly, I'm fascinated with your, your contention, Joseph, that, like, these are most interesting within the lens of competition, either falling from it, right, you know, struggling with it, then rising to it. Like you said, with F1, with Fitzpatrick, whoever. Do you disagree? I think that's a, no, I do. No, I agree. I, I'm really like, and why this one maybe fell flat. I mean, I think that's a really salient kind of point. It's a sports show, right? Like at yeah. the, people want, I want to know that somebody's interesting and we'll get to this in the next episode. And then you get to watch them compete and like yeah. realize their dreams. Like that's what's fun about sports. So to talk about why you no longer want to be a competitive professional athlete, in my opinion, like, Maybe that's why the episode fell flat. What do we want to grade this? I think like we, we, I, I'm, I'm, I, I would just want to be clear. I watched, I watched all these twice. I watched this one specifically a third time to make sure I wasn't like being unfair or missing a lot. And I, I was just like, found myself more bothered by the whole thing and getting nothing from it. So like, I'm grading it, whatever, just a D or a failure. Do you guys need to grade it or do you just, you're, you don't approve? I, I'm gonna give it a, uh, uh, I'll give it a D. Okay. I did. I gleaned a couple of things of insight from it, but a complete, a complete failure to tell the most, you know, the biggest story in golf since Tiger Woods. Joseph. For me, I almost like abstain from voting. Yeah. It made me feel nothing. Like I, I, I didn't hate it because I didn't think it was like super tacky and cheesy but like i just didn't get anything it made me feel nothing so i'll give it a d do you think i mean not to like put our shoes put ourselves in someone's shoes do you think anyone who clammed to this cold or naive about the situation thought this was good or interesting like your significant other or your mom or dad or somebody i just don't i don't know that it told the story well for them either so i think that's the thing is like i watching this a second time through i you know I've like been really into even like the Smith and JT one, I didn't think was great, but I was like, you know, eagerly this one. It was a struggle to watch it a second time. All right. And I think if you're does... Ian Poulter and you say, Hey, if you don't understand why I went to live, just wait until the Netflix documentary comes out. Now you'll understand. Like we didn't learn any. No, no. We knew exactly why you went. Like there was nothing illuminating. So yeah. All Sounds right. like we're on the same page. Yep. That does it for our recap of episode three. We'll be back with episode four on Joel Damon. A very different kind of story told in the uh, next episode. Thanks for your uh, support. Full swing thoughts. Thoughts.